Well, we're going we're gonna to turn things around a little bit. Usually you with the Ask Ligonier and Ask Ligonier Live, you're the interviewer, but now... I'm always kind to you when we do those live events. So are you, are you expecting me to be kind to you, Mr. Bingham? Love your neighbor, love your enemy, <laughs> like you have to love me. I will certainly be kind to you. Well, I, we were just talking about how crucial this session is because it's where you live and we're talking about following Christ in the digital age. So you're so helpful uh, to people on this. Uh, let's just start with, with thinking about technology. It's everywhere. Um, we even see now going down the road, these vehicles that are just pure technology, cyber trucks. Um, so help us here. Is technology good? Is technology bad? Let's get started. So that's a really good question, Dr. Nichols. Is technology good or bad? And in some sense, it can, it can depend on how you define technology. But if you, if you had asked me a decade or more ago, I probably would have said that technology is neutral. It just depends how you use it. Uh, you think of a, a wheel. Um, if you have a wheel, you could use that wheel to take you to an always ready event. And that would be a good thing. And you're using that piece of technology in a good way. Uh, you could use that wheel to take you to an unwholesome place where perhaps you shouldn't be. Um, or you could just run over your brother or sister with that, that wheel. That would also be bad. And that's essentially a neutral understanding of technology, that it, it depends how you use it. You could use it for good, you could use it for bad. And when we're talking about technology, we are thinking more of smartphones, iPhones, social media platforms, and things like that. And when the iPhone came out, many people had that approach that this device is neutral, you can use it for good, you can use it for bad. But as time has gone on, we've begun to see that these, uh, this technology is actually changing us. It's changing the way your brains actually work and function, and that the companies that are behind this, th these, this, these platforms, social media platforms in particular, that they're not motivated by the highest good being human flourishing. They're businesses. They're corporations. Their motivation is for more money to go into their bank account, which is not bad in and of itself. The, you know, we, we believe that a man is worthy of his wages and for a company to be seeking profit is not in and of itself a bad thing. But we need to remember that if Facebook, Instagram, X, TikTok, Snapchat, I shouldn't say if, since these are free, it means that you actually are the product. That's why they can have these platforms and scale them around the world without making you pay for them, because you are the product. And these companies track everything that you do. Many of them sell that data. They sell it for advertising, and that's how they make money. And they're in what is called the attention economy, where their number one priority is to get your eyeballs in their app and not their competitor's app for as long as possible. So they have uh, um, various models that they've developed to be able to learn when it is that you might be getting disinterested in their app. You know that the news feed is now uh, algorithm-based. It's always trying to put what's that next little bit of content that it thinks you will uh, continue watching, consuming. And so your version of Instagram, your version of Facebook is different than the person sitting next to you because they're tailoring it not for your good, but they're tailoring it for your attention. How can they keep you in that app? So we have to be mindful of, of that. Um, there is this expression that to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When we think about that, a hammer in a sense is very neutral. It's very basic. It's not like these smartphones. It's not like these platforms. But still, even the act of being given a hammer and putting it in your hand does change you. And so having a smartphone, having access to social media does change you. 
The data from 2007 when the iPhone was released to today shows for your generation, or I should say your age group, a continual increase in depression, anxiety, self-harm, and even suicide. And the early results from a lot of these studies were showing a correlation that as we began to use smartphones and technology more and spent more of our time on these platforms and these apps, we saw anxiety and depression increasing, but we couldn't necessarily come to the point of saying there's causation here. But there are many experts now that are very confident that there is causation. That as you are using these devices, it is taking you away from community, it's taking you away from human face-to-face -face connection and human flourishing. Instead, we're having mediated relationships. And if you think to how you use your devices, I'm sure most of you would say the majority of your conversation with your friends, even those friends that you might go to church with or go to school with or go to college with, people that you can actually see face-to-face, the majority of that communication is actually mediated through texting or DMing them. Um, and so we have found ourselves, and you find yourself living in a generation where your relationships are mediated, and so you're not having that human connection. And we were designed for relationships. We're designed for in-person uh, conversation and community. And that is psychologically causing damage uh, to us. Plus, the way that social media has been crafted to capture your attention, you think of Instagram, the most popular posts on Instagram are of beautiful people living beautiful, perfect lives. And so someone posts a photo, you post a photo on Instagram, and you're trying to just capture it at just the right angle so that everything looks just right. And um, people interact with that, they give you hearts, give you likes. And so it's reinforcing to you if you want to get hearts, you want to get likes, you want to get shares or, you know, engagement on your posts, you have to publish and take photos and publish updates on that platform that look just like that. And so it is this self-fulfilling prophecy, it's this circular thing where you have these f feeds filled with the most beautiful people with uh, wearing the most beautiful clothes in the most beautiful, perfect poses um, with filters and all of those kinds of things. And so what does that do when I look at Instagram? It tells me I don't look like that. I don't have clothes like that. I don't look just right. And you know what I'm talking about. You look through and see your friends and what they're posting online. Perhaps you even see them out somewhere with friends and you weren't invited. And so you have this feedback loop of negativity because none of us can live up to the pixel-perfect profile of the most successful accounts on Instagram. So that leads to depression, anxiety, can lead to body image issues, where we think everyone's meant to look just like that, but we don't. And that is what's reinforced through these algorithms. Um, so is technology good? Is technology bad? Is it neutral? It's a complicated issue, but we need to remember, particularly as Christians, that the largest social media platforms and most of the apps that we're spending our time on, they have a bias, they're created and developed by sinners, and they're not building those apps so that you can flourish as a disciple of Christ. They're building those apps so that they can capture your attention and so that they can make a profit. And we have seen the damage that it has done since around 2007, 2010, it gets even more significant. We've been able to observe the damage that it has done to teenagers that have grown up and gone through their teenage years in that digital uh, age. That's so helpful. Thanks for sort of pulling back the curtain and helping us see that and think through that. In light of that, uh, help them just navigate these pitfalls and those challenges that are there in this digital age and in these social media platforms. So technology and social media can be used for good. We both work at Ligonier Ministries and uh, Ligonier Ministries has a significant presence on social media. 
We're sharing images of today's event and quotes and teaching. We're live streaming on those platforms. So even though I'm saying that there is a negative bias to much of the technology today, it can be used for good. And as Christians, we need to be wise and we need to be aware of that because if we're not aware, if you're not aware, then you'll just be carried on by the current of culture. And the, the end state of that is not good. So you can use it for good. I was even talking to someone today and, and heard of um, a, a young girl that's here today because her mother saw this conference mentioned on Facebook. And her mother's like, oh, I really think you should attend this event. Um, so even some of you here are likely here because you or your youth pastor or your parents saw this conference mentioned on Facebook or some, some other platform. But I think if you want to combat the, the big challenges of um, right thinking, mental health, and the, the damage that we have seen just across the board, not exclusively to Christians, but just to teenagers that are living in this digital space, we need to think about this theologically. And one of the key areas that I believe will help you flourish in a digital age is understanding the question of identity. If you do not understand that as a Christian, your identity is found in Christ, that you are accepted by God the Father completely and totally because of the work of Christ, and that there is nothing you can do as a Christian to make God love you less, there's nothing you can do as a Christian to make God love you more, that your right standing before Him, the reason that you will go to heaven is entirely because of what Christ has done on your behalf. If you don't recognize that, then you will be chasing your identity like the world does in other things whether it is in a success in sports, whether it is your grades in school, or whether it's how many people follow you on Instagram or how much engagement you get when you post. Those in the world, they are driven by affirmation from their peers. They want their friends to say, well, you're looking beautiful, sis, or whatever they say in the comments on Instagram. I don't talk like yeah. that. We don't talk like that. You could, you could call me bro okay, if you want, bro. maybe. But you see, guys don't generally compliment each other's looks on social media, but no. it's strange. A girl posts something on Instagram, it's just filled with like 500 comments of other girls saying that they think they're beautiful. I don't understand that space. But um, you understand it more than me. But they are living for the affirmation of their peers. You do not need to live for affirmation from those in your youth group, from your siblings, from those in your school, or those strangers even online who might be interacting with you on social media, because your affirmation comes because of the work of Christ on your behalf. You love God because He first loved you. It was God who chose you. It is God who elected you. And when you realize that you are accepted, as I said earlier, by God the Father completely, completely because of the work of Christ. And you cannot, cannot add to Christ's merit and you cannot take away from Christ's merit. It gives you so much freedom and liberty to be able to serve God, to be laughed at. As Dr. Parsons was saying earlier, the world will hate you. The reason that you can you know, say something in a classroom or walk down the street and be laughed at and be scoffed and for it to be okay is because you are not finding your worth and your value in what the world says or what your peers say. So when you realize that your identity is found in Christ, there is so much freedom that you can serve God and seek to be faithful and be bold. And if you don't understand that, and believe me, it's not just an academic exercise. You can hear what I have just said and say, amen. I know that to be true, to live that, and to believe that day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year is hard. And we need to preach the gospel to ourselves. And I'm sure if you're active on social media, you might try and post and ghost where you just post it. Like, I don't care what people say about this. I'm not gonna check the engagement. But then you go back and you're like, but did people like it? How many people watch that reel? How many hearts did I get? And you have to remind yourself and preach the gospel to yourself and say, I am, my worth and my value is not found 
in that interaction, that engagement. My worth is found in Christ. So it is a theological truth that we need to preach to ourselves and remind ourselves. We need to remind ourselves of that because we all can be tempted to fall back into seeking the affirmation and acceptance from the world or other people when really we have to meditate and preach to ourselves that we are accepted because we're in Christ. And if, if you don't wrestle with that, if you don't meditate upon that, if you don't believe that, then you will be ensnared. You will be caught in that trap that the world is when it comes to social media. And so there is an incredible amount of freedom found in Christ. And it means you can use social media and not get sucked into um, that trap of doing it for the affirmation, likes, heart, shares of, of your peers, or as I said earlier, even strangers. Yeah. It's so important that fundamental notion of our identity is in Christ and it's, it's true for every age, as, as you mentioned, but these, uh, you mentioned it earlier, so it, it can be used for good. It can be used as, as we use in context of Ligonier in terms of um, a very strategic way, uh, leverage uh, to, to uh, advance teaching and pr proclaim the gospel. So as we think about uh, the pitfalls, as you helped us, now let's think about where it could be used for good, and even think in terms of in the context of the life of the church and social media, the digital age. Technology has opened up so many opportunities for great commission work, for the, for the gospel to be proclaimed. I think of Ligonier Ministries. We, we are seeking to have active ministry in the world's top 20 languages. A lot of that footprint is digital. So there is incredible work that is being done uh, through the use of technology. I think even myself, uh, once I was a Christian, I was saved into the Pentecostal church and uh, I won't get into that entire story, but as I was looking for more truth and the Lord was sanctifying me and growing me in my understanding of scripture, I discovered Ligonier Ministries and RC Sproul Online and would listen to Renewing Your Mind, the podcast from Australia 15 years ago. Um, and so we don't want to downplay the significance of, of the role that the technology has, has played in the spread of truth. Every good gift comes from our Father in heaven, and technology is a good gift if it's used rightly. And so Christians can use it well. But I do want to give a word to the youth pastors that are here and church leaders that might be here, and at the same token to everyone else, all the teenagers that are here, for the church to flourish in this digital age, especially with the changes that will come over the next decade, AI, deep fakes, Web3, it's here already, but the, the technology of 2007 to 2017 will be vastly different to what we're seeing from 2024 to 2034. Like we, we're just about to turn this corner into a radical different world. Um, Gen Alpha coming behind you, the world that they grow up in will be very different to the world you grew up in. And for the church to flourish in the, the sea of all of this technological change, the area where I think there needs to be greater improvement is through generational conversation. So to you young people here, I know that you laugh because your mom and dad really don't know how to use their iPhones well. And even if your parents did know how to use smartphones because they were fairly young when smartphones came out, the, everything has changed and the apps that are there today and even the UI is different. Like they just, they're tapping with their fat fingers and nothing seems to work. You can't relate to that, right? You can. Um, and it's funny, and you're just like, mom, dad, like, what are you doing? You don't know how to use these tools. And it's true, we confess, we may not be the best with the latest app, the latest tools, the latest technology. But your parents and your grandparents, if you're blessed to live in a Christian, have grown up in a Christian home, they have studied God's word for decades. And they have meditated upon God's word. They have been in in church and heard sermons and reflected upon the truths of God's word and they have great wisdom. The gap is that they have the wisdom, they don't necessarily know how or what to apply it to in the world that you're living in. So you see that, but the, 
the truth is in reverse for you. You know how to use the technology. You're very, very quick, and your fingers are just dainty enough that you can tap all the things. But you have not had the years in God's Word to know how to necessarily use those apps and those platforms and those tools as wisely as we should as Christians. So my exhortation to the church and where I think the church needs to improve is the conversation between generations. We need older folks, seasoned saints, speaking to the younger saints in the church. And we need you as teenagers being willing to talk to mom and dad or to your grandparents and actually let them know where are your challenges. If you're being bullied or you just don't know how to respond to some of the conversation that you're observing online, go to an older saint. And even though they might not know how to send a DM or post a reel or get captions or whatever the thing might be, they have great wisdom. So my encouragement would be for us to flourish in this digital age, you all need to talk to mom and dad or to your grandparents or to other older, more mature saints in your local congregation. Because if we can get your generation talking to the older and wiser generation, then the church will be better equipped to use today's technology for the glory of God and for the proclamation of the gospel and furtherance of of Great Commission efforts. Thank you. Join me in thanking Mr. Bingham.